you can't think yourself into clarity. Action is going to lead to clarity. Are you happy in your job or do you find yourself dreading the upcoming week on Sunday nights? Well, unfortunately, I think a lot of people in medicine are feeling that way right now. And a lot of people are looking for a change. It could just be changes they want to make in their practice. It could be wanting to change a specialty. It could be wanting to move into a non-clinical role, or it could be wanting to leave medicine altogether. The problem often comes though that a lot of people know they want to change, but they just don't know how or what to change. So we're going to address that today. I am joined by a fellow PA who is also a life coach and a podcaster. Her name is Hope Cook and her podcast is called Recharting Your Life with Hope. Welcome Hope. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So Hope, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your PA career so far? So I started out in internal medicine almost 20 years ago, wow. <laughs> and I worked in that for maybe five years and then switched over to dermatology. And I loved specializing, I still do. So I did that up until about a year ago when I really started asking myself if I wanted to do this for another you know, 20 years or 15 years. Um, the turning point came when my husband and I went to see a financial planner and he casually said after looking over the paperwork, okay, Hope, I have you down for another 20 years and you should be pretty set. <laughs> and I didn't even know that I was going to have this reaction, but my <laughs> eyes filled up with tears and I just panicked. I could feel my heart pounding out of my chest and my husband's looking at me like, what is going on? And we get in the elevator and I'm like, I can't do it. I can't do this another 20 years. And he's like, well, what are you going to do? And, you know, do you want to switch specialties? Do you want to, you know, so that sort of started my path of trying to figure out what it was. Um, and it took, you know, it took a while. So after you had that moment of panic, what happened? So I started, well, I'd all, always read self-help books but I noticed that I was devouring them and I was seeing a therapist and I was talking to my friends and I was just looking for answers everywhere. Sure. And looking back, I think I wanted somebody to give me permission to sort of pivot. Um, but I didn't know that at the time. So I did yoga teacher certification. I studied functional medicine. I took Spanish lessons. I, I did all these things and each one brought me joy. And I feel like each one was sort of a stepping stone to the next thing. And then I discovered life coaching and I started podcasting. So that's been sort of my journey up until now. I think it's kind of important to note that some of those things that you tried, even if they didn't become a big part of your life, they still brought you joy while you were doing them, which can help people fight those feelings of burnout. But I think they also give you some forward momentum and get your mind thinking in a different way. If you're feeling down, burned out, or just sort of stuck, the answer is not to go looking for happiness. People think, you know, once I do this, then I'll be happy. The real answer answer is finding something that will give you a sense of purpose. So, you know, whether it was me learning Spanish so I could go on a mission trip and practice my skills or, you know, yoga teacher certification helped me sort of tap into a deeper place um, mm -hmm. and help students do the same thing. You're not going to come up with answers by writing it all down on a sheet of paper, you know, thinking you can't think yourself into clarity action is going to lead to clarity. So just start taking steps, just little baby steps. If you love cooking, sign up for a, you know, Indian cooking class. Little things like that can help move you towards the next step. Do you find sometimes that people don't actually pursue hobbies or interests because they think it's not going to lead anywhere in the long run, that it would just kind of be a waste of time? Yes, all the time. And if you're really burned out, you're probably thinking, yeah, I can't, I can't take a cooking class. I can't even like come up for air. I'm barely surviving. <laughs> but what these things do is help move you along your path. And they also help you not rely on work to fill up your bucket. These other things helped put some excitement, creativity, and energy back in my bucket. So how did you become a life coach? Is there some kind of training that you have to have or certification? So yeah, you technically don't have to be certified to call yourself a life coach. It's kind of like a wellness coach or any of these coaches. You could just call yourself that. 
I'm going through Martha Beck. She's um, written for O Magazine and she's one of the most well-known life coaches because of her ties with Oprah. I'm still working. I work a couple of days a week and I can use my life coaching certificate to um, help patients. You know, if they're sort of stuck on not doing what I tell them to do, I can ask them, you know, well, what's, what's sort of the story in your head? What are you thinking? And we do a lot of thought examining. So do you have a particular focus for your life coach business? Like, are you working specifically with PAs? It's funny that PAs and um, people in the healthcare field seem to be attracted to me. Um, but I do, you know, lawyers and um, artists and just people from all different careers. You know, I always defined myself as a PA and that was such a a badge that I wore and I sort of had blinders on and I didn't realize that I could be other things. I could be a writer. I could, you know, when people say, what do you do? Sometimes I'll, I won't even say PA. I'll just say, I'm a writer and podcaster or, you know, whatever, I, whatever hat I feel like wearing that day. And, um, and it, it's just, you know, I think it's important to open PA's eyes to, you can do so many different things and you can still be a PA. So how do you feel now? Do you feel like you have a different attitude on the days that you practice medicine? Yes, it is completely different. Like I said, I was to the point where I didn't know what was wrong. I just felt pulled in a different direction. So I actually quit my job or I tried to, and thankfully my boss um, asked if I wanted to stay and work a day or two a week. Um, because I was to that point where I was like, I don't know what is going to be a good fit, but I feel like I'm no longer, you know, it, this no longer fits. And I didn't know why. What do you think accounts for that difference? Why do you find joy in practicing medicine now when it's the same job and you were feeling burnt out before? I think it's two things. One is my perception of it. That is one thing I have learned in life coaching that has helped me in every area of my life is your mindset and you know you hear the word mindset thrown around or limiting beliefs but until you take one of your thoughts and examine it it's it's just so eye-opening um how we cause suffering in our lives based on what is up here what we're thinking yeah. and we're so attached to our thoughts that we don't even realize they're not real they're just thoughts right. um so that helped a lot. And then, like I said earlier, I think of life as having buckets. And so I stopped um, relying on work to fill up my bucket completely. Yeah. So now I have these other things that um, help with my creativity and just light me up in different ways. So I think it's funny if you asked somebody who was struggling in medicine, you know, do you need more creativity in your life? I'm sure they'd be like, no, that's not what I need. I need to see less patients. I need to not have to fight insurance companies all the time. Those are the things that I need. I don't need more creativity. But I think as humans, we don't really realize what we need. I think we don't, until we try something that brings us some unexpected joy or fulfillment, I don't think that we realize what we're missing. But when it comes down to it, there are people probably out there saying, well, yeah, I know I need something, but I don't know what. How do I figure out what it is that I need? What, what advice do you have for them? Yeah, so I have a few thoughts. One is think about what you used to love to do when you were a kid. For my husband, it was exploring like the neighborhood and the woods on his bicycle. So he now rides a bike to work and he is like a kid on that bicycle. It just <laughs> lights him up. Um, so think about what you used to love to do as a kid. The mm -hmm. other thing is what do people ask your advice for? What do they say? Uh -huh you know, you're really good at this. And you may not even realize that it's a skill because you're so good at it. You just assume everybody's good at it, but you know, it may be something that you're uniquely suited for. The other thing is strength finders. So you don't have to do that particular name brand, but um, there's something called high five you can do and you figure out what your strengths are. So what are those things that you're talking about? Are they classes or online products you can buy? Like a quiz, an online okay. quiz. We had one that we did at work mm -hmm. and I met with our office manager. This was when I was still feeling really like, oh, what do I want to do? And we went through my top five strengths. One of mine was teaching and he made me sort of list on a scale of one to five, like how often do you feel like you're using the strength at work? 
And I used to take students and that was my teaching and that filled me up, but I didn't really realize it. And then after COVID started, I stopped having students. So as we went through those top five strengths, I was like, no wonder I'm not fulfilled right now. And right. so then I started looking outside of work to figure out, okay, could I teach? You know, I, I ended up signing up for a class for the senior citizens in our community. Oh. And I taught them a class and, you know, that kind of yeah. helped fill up that bucket. So the online quizzes you were talking about, what what are their names again? Yeah, Strength. so one is Strength Finder. Another one is High Five. Um, I think High Five is free and Strength Finder probably has a free version. So doing those quizzes, do they, do they give you like very specific answers? Like, can they really help you identify a profession or maybe an area of medicine that you're well suited to? Yeah, it can get really specific. Like um, if you're a strategic thinker, you know, maybe you like to work in a certain type of medicine. Yeah, my friend is more of an analyzer. So she loves pouring over lab results and, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. You you just yeah. don't know until you take it. And then when you're looking at the results, it's like, oh, yeah, that's why I always <laughs> loved chemistry or whatever. Right. Yeah, and I, I guess they could really help you kind of tailor your practice. That's one thing that I often ask about in my videos when I'm interviewing people that work in specialties, like, is there an opportunity to kind of form a niche practice uh, within that specialty? Yes, Michelle, I love that. Because if you love young people, you know, seeing acne patients, if you work in dermatology, that may light you up. So you, you just have to look at whether you can sort of uh, tweak your current practice to fill up whatever part of you is, is lacking. Right. Yeah. So once you've identified something you like to do, either from a past experience or from these quizzes, what are some ways that people can incorporate their strengths into their practices? Yeah, so I have people do sort of a future me exercise. So I have them visualize um, waking up maybe five years from now. And from the moment they get up, what does the room look like? What do they eat for breakfast? What kind of clothes do they put on? What are they kind of car are they getting in? Mm -hmm. What kind of office do they come to? And, you know, are they greeted by the front office staff? Do they work hand in hand with the physician or are they more autonomous? And by visualizing what you want, you can see exactly which areas are sort of off in your current life and then take those one by one. Maybe if you like teaching, you know, you can, um, look at why you're not teaching. And one of the things that pops up, maybe I don't have enough time. And so that's, I would examine that thought, you know, I don't have enough time and really dissect it and, you know, ask yourself, is that true? Let's, right. let's go through and figure out, you know, how yeah. much of that is up here. You know, if you say, I, I cannot see whatever, 44 patients a day, you know, then my next question is, well, have you talked to the office manager about it? Have you brainstormed, like, if you had an extra medical assistant, like, how would that work? And so often we don't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, I was at, at a different job. I just stayed miserably stuck. And mm -hmm. when I finally started looking at, like, why won't I do anything about it? that's when I finally had to sort of step up to the plate and I, I started brainstorming and coming up with all these ideas. Honestly, I think sometimes we just stay where we're at, even if we're miserable, because it's comfortable. It's a misery we know. And it just seems so daunting and kind of scary to think about making changes in our life. But moving forward and making those changes is the only way to really get out of that burnout and to find something that fulfills us and makes us happy. Yeah, we spend so much of our lives at work, like a third of our lives at work. So if you are miserable, you've got to do something about it. I mean, you don't want to end up on your deathbed. The number one regret of the dying is that you lived a life that was not true to yourself. And so you don't want to get to retirement or to the end of your life and really wish you could have a do-over. I mean, this is it. This is not a dress rehearsal. So if you are miserable, it's going to bleed over into your relationships, into mm -hmm. your health. So mm -hmm. you have got to do something about it. Everything can seem overwhelming if you just look at the big picture and think about all the things that has to happen in order to make a change. Like if you're moving from one specialty to another. But I guess what you're saying is that if you 
break it down bit by bit and just take little steps along the way that it makes it much easier. So say for instance, since you're in dermatology, say that somebody wants to move into dermatology um, and they just feel overwhelmed because they've heard that it's a really hard specialty to get into. How would you advise them to go about doing that? I'm glad you asked. Um, my coworker is a perfect example. So she is a PA who happened to be a PA student for me um, years ago, and she loved dermatology, but she wanted to do primary care when she graduated. So she arranged it so that she would come on her day off every other week and shadow me. And we, we called it her externship. It was not an official thing. She didn't right. get paid, um, but she would come in and she would, I would let her learn to do procedures and, you know, see if she could guess the diagnosis before <laughs> I did. And lo and behold, she got a job in dermatology. Another one of my coworkers, he didn't work in, um, dermatology, but he started paying to go to conferences, especially mm -hmm. local conferences. And he would introduce himself, he would get business cards, and he would say, if you hear of anything in dermatology, please call me. Right. And that's what happened. A drug rep or a pharmaceutical rep called him and said, I heard that this office is hiring. And so yeah. that's how he got into the specialty. Networking, networking, networking. I feel like I say that in every video that I make. For the most part, I found that PAs really do like to help other PAs. And if you're shy about approaching somebody or asking if they know of any openings, maybe if you find somebody who's in the specialty that you're interested in, maybe just ask them if they have any advice for somebody looking to get into that specialty. I think that's a low key way to kind of start a conversation with somebody. So we've talked about the life coaching. What about the podcasting? What, what is the focus of your podcast? Well, it's not anything to do with healthcare, although I have interviewed a few PAs, but I interview women who have sort of been at that stuck place where they didn't really know what to do. They weren't sure what their next step was. And then they pivoted and they took a step in a brave new direction. So I have interviewed women who, you know, moved overseas or sold everything and lived on a sailboat or <laughs> adopted a child from Russia, you know, just all these things that they weren't planning to do and they found themselves in a stuck place. So they sort of changed course and did it. So for your podcast, do you have a new episode every week? Yep. Once a week and it's on Apple, it's on, you know, Spotify, all the, all the stations. I've just hit a hundred episodes. Well, that's great. So anything else, any other words of wisdom that you want to share with people? Yeah, I would just say hang in there. If you are at that place where you're like, oh, I just don't know what to do, hang in there. Sometimes, you know, there is a, a cocoon stage to change. And so you may be in that stage where you're sort of in this little cocoon and you don't know which way is up and which way is down. If you're in that stage, be patient. You don't have to take action yet. You need to just sort of um, sit with yourself, sit with what's up here. I highly recommend Julia Cameron's book, The Artist Way. It's not just for artists, but she walks you through like a daily journaling. Uh -huh. And then she also has something cool called Artist Dates, where you take yourself once a week on a planned outing and it can be free. It can be, you know, anything like going to look at produce at the farmer's market, yeah. but it just sort of works to help you figure out what lights you up. I know there's some people out there who already know that they want to leave medicine but are struggling because they can't figure out what direction to head into. They're almost paralyzed because they feel like they have to know exactly what they're doing and have to have all the steps figured out. But I love the advice that you're giving us today that we should just take baby steps, do small things, you know, take these quizzes or try some different hobbies, you know, basically just dipping your toe in the water and testing out different things. And then eventually you will find something that you like. You know, life is amazing. The more things that we do, the more things that we discover about ourselves, the more the doors are open for us and new opportunities we never even thought about present themselves. So thank you so much for sharing that advice with us. I appreciate it. Best wishes to you on your life coaching and your podcasting and your continued work as a PA. Thanks for joining us, Hope. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed being here. So if you've been watching this and realize you need to make a change and want to take some baby steps, you can do that by watching some of the videos on my channel where I interview people working in different specialties 
I highlight cool and unique jobs. I also show you some non-clinical roles and businesses that you can start as a PA or an NP. I'll see you next time on The Medicine Couch. Bye.